Actually, Dennis and I did do a lot of reminiscing during dinner here, and there should be a lecture on Harbor Branch one of these days. <laughs> I mean, you bring up a lot of interesting stories of a... We would charge for that, probably. <laughs> <laughs> a small marine laboratory and all the adventures that took place uh, here and around the world. Um, well, I was to discuss biodiversity, which is a topic dear to my heart, and uh, uh, the, defining it first, I'd like to define it for you, and then uh, talking about what biodiversity means. Why is it important? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about evolution relative to that, and, and then talk about some of those global centers of biodiversity and why they're there, uh, so we can see why we have a center of biodiversity here. We're going to have to take a look at other parts of the world as well. And then um, what might be the fate of these areas in the future, and, uh, and how we might uh, consider them more carefully. Um, of course, biodiversity is biological diversity. It's a diversity of life. And it's been defined in many different ways. There are formulas that we can actually use to calculate diversity, and I won't go into that. But basically, it's the number of organisms or number of species, number of genotypes. So we can talk about their DNA, or we can talk about phenotypes, the external morphology of animals. You can take it well down into the molecular side. But it's basically the diversity of life. And why is biological variation and diversity of life important? How did all this life come to exist in preferred places? Some places we have many different species and others we don't. And I'd like to also go into um, what organisms do and what we know that life uh, does based on um, evolution, of course. And, of course, scientists, we call this evolutionary theory, and a lot of people think that's theoretical, but we also call gravitational theory gravitational theory. And if you saw the movie Gravity, I don't think Sandra Bullock thought it was very theoretical. <laughs> and there was conservation of momentum and all kinds of physical laws that were impl implemented in that movie. The same thing goes for biological laws. There are laws that give us evolutionary theory. Um, one, of course, organisms are on Earth are competing for food, space, and basic survival. And some places are better for that. All organisms are unique in some way. All of you in the audience, I was looking for identical twins earlier. I didn't see any. I don't see any here tonight. I miss any. It still may not be identical, but everybody's different. That's one of the premises of evolutionary theory. No two organisms can occupy the same space at the same time. You can try to sit on your neighbor in the seat there, but I don't think it'll be very comfortable. Not all progeny offspring will survive. Selection will take place somehow. Everybody has a different uh, number of days on this planet. And genetic and morphological phenotypic traits are inherited. Genetic traits are inherited, yet variation occurs between generations. No one's in the different generations. It's like the previous generation. And this is particularly important in sexual reproducing species. And this gives us our biological diversity. It's very important for survival of life of all living things. I was going to try to put this guy in the driveway there as an identical twin. But I decided, well, I'll just put him inside having a, a beer. Uh, and we could decide which one of these identical twins is likely to survive. Well, of course, if he drinks too much beer, it might be the guy inside the house. But uh, there, even though you have identical twins, you have different environments that create the difference in survival. Now, we also like to clone things. You heard about goats being, sheep being cloned or whatever. Uh, there are fish that are cloned all the time, actually, quite frankly. Uh, one that lives locally is cloned. Um, this is an orange grove nearby, as seen from the air. 
And typically, orange trees are cloned onto a, a, a rootstock. And you may have the same clone in a portion of the grove or the entire grove. So what happens if one tree is diseased and they all have the same resistance to the disease and they don't resist the disease, um, such as canker or citrus greening or attacks by insects, um, the entire grove could go. Now, I, I had some observations at my house, um, which are kind of interesting, and these are probably just don't mean anything, but I thought it was is rather curious, but it leads to biological diversity. Um, there were a number of citrus trees on, on my land, and they all died after the hurricanes uh, due to canker initially, and I think greening next, uh, except for a couple trees. And the, those trees are still giving a lot of fruit, and one of these citrus trees is seen here, and it's adjacent to a mango tree. In case you aren't sure about mangoes, what they are, these are the mangoes right here. And those are my citrus trees that never succumb to disease. And um, so I was wondering if the mango had anything to do with it. Uh, maybe it didn't, but uh, the diversity of those trees uh, and the proximity appeared to um, create some situation where they weren't as susceptible to disease. Now, this is a typical photograph that could be taken almost anywhere in Florida, uh, suburban Florida. Does it have high, high biodiversity? If not, why not? And we have the obligatory queen palms in the yard and probably St. Augustine grass. And actually, my place started this way. It was all a grass field. I was looking for a um, wooded lot, and I could, we couldn't find one. I looked for two years for one that we could afford. But we, we could find this old grove site, which is cheaper. It has two acres, but it was cheaper than a house lot further in town. And we were really proud that at least we had two trees on it, one there and that palm tree there. That was struck by lightning and killed as we were building the house. <laughs> so we had that tree there. And uh, I wanted to have trees, so I started planting trees. And, um, and this is what it looks like today. And we have a lot of trees and other plants as well, uh, ferns and shrubs and things of that nature. And it's a fruitful yard, too. We have some fruit trees, the papaya, banana, and the, the mango I showed you earlier. Um, and that diversity of plants has really been... Uh, a great thing to, well, first of all, see a plant grow and then also experience it after it's, it's grown. And of course, there are orchids there. This is coral bean. This is, this is a native plant right here, uh, which grows in our hammocks. It's growing here at Harbor Branch in the hammock here. And I started putting up a few years ago wildlife infrared cameras. We got this coyote. I also had uh, bobcats and things of that nature. And one day coming back and pulling into my driveway, it's still daylight. I had a, actually had a panther trotting from the car. Now this is just four houses off of uh, 58th or Kings Highway in Vero Beach, the road you go down to the mall. So it's, it's not way out in the wilderness anywhere, but apparently my um, yard was a throughway for some of the wildlife as a result of the biodiversity and all the plants that were there in the forest. And uh, life at several different levels. I didn't expect the panther to show up, but there it was. Um, so, what creates this, greatest, this great diversity, and where are they in the aquatic world? And uh, so let's take a look at them. Oh, well, first of all, I wanted to talk about North America in general, and this is tree species. Um, Boreal Canada. You have to go 2,000 miles below the North Pole to come to boreal trees in Canada, and there are 20 species. Massachusetts, 55. My front yard, 56. North Carolina, 200. Florida, total of 
275, then when you get to Belize and Central America, 700. If you go into South America, you'll, you'll see thousands. And so it's obvious that as you go into the tropics, and these organisms like the warmth, and there's a lot of action going on at all levels. The plants to the top predators and herbivores, and you have low biodiversity in the polar regions. So if we're going to look for centers of biodiversity in the water, in the ocean, we're basically going to look at those equatorial regions. However, even in those equatorial region, regions, there are areas of low biodiversity and areas of high biodiversity. These are the two highest regions of biodiversity, uh, the ones with the greatest number of species. By far, the Indo-Pacific region, this one here, has more species, and I'm just giving you the fish there, but you're talking about tens of hundreds of thousands when we start talking about all the other organisms there, is the richest aquatic uh, flora and fauna in the world. And there are several things that come into play in making this the rich area that it is. One, of course, is temperature you see there. Ocean currents play a role, but we also have boundaries overlapping here, we call in biology ecotones. And when they had the symposium here a week or two ago, uh, Bob Bernstein gave the keynote talk. He actually started talking about those boundaries just around seagrass beds, right out here at Harbor Branch, and how the edge, we call it an edge effect as well, uh, concentrates organisms. And the more different types of habitats increase the diversity of edges and ecotones and create high biodiversity. Well, I'm going to talk about this from a global perspective from this outer space. I'm going to draw boundaries around this portion of the world, showing you what was out of the water 12,000 years ago in the last ice age. So you, you could actually walk from Indochina down to Barneo and Sumatra. Um, the Philippines were connected through the land bridges to this large land mass. Therefore, the Western Pacific was separated from the Indian Ocean. This fauna and this fauna were separated. Now, as sea level rose, and by the way, that sea level took Florida out of, out of the, uh, we'd be 300 feet above uh, sea level right now. Once that was inundated, with the melting of the ice after the last glaciation, these two faunas came together and they overlapped in this region, which created that richness. It's one of the things that created that richness. You also had fresh water bodies there. You had lakes, streams, tropical rivers, uh, many different islands of different sizes, and uh, all that created diversity of habitats and certainly coral reefs. So this region has the most, the highest biodiversity, the most aquatic species of any other region on Earth. These are just some of the, the shell of snails we call nudibranchs that you can see there. Um, I had to put some invertebrates into the talk. And you can see how different, and of course they're quite colorful, so it's kind of nice. I mean, they're colorful fish too. But. Um, so now if we go to our region of the world and take a look at what it was like during the last glaciation, we can see that Florida was actually twice as large as it is now. Uh, and the shoreline here was out at the place we call the Oculina Reef offshore here, where we took the submarines from Harbor Branch here out to study right along the edge there. You see the Gulf of Mexico is considerably smaller, and it was considerably cooler as well. The Bahama platform, a lot of those islands are connected to the large landmass with cliffs that actually dropped off all around the Bahama platform um, and in Cuba. And it was still probably tropical down in this area of the Caribbean. Now we see on a cold winter day, um, the warm water comes up into the Gulf. We can see the Gulf has largely cooled down. You see where the coolest water is, and this is coming down to the Chesapeake Bay. And then we have the transitional temperature. We call this the Carolinian province right there because it is transitional between the tropics and the uh, 
temperate regions. In Florida, we have 1,300 species of fish recorded from Florida. Uh, Chesapeake Bay has 283 fish species. Idaho has 56. Tampa Bay has almost 300, uh, if we want to compare areas of Florida. Bahama Islands have between 500 and 600 species of fish. So we have twice as many species of fish in Florida than we do in the Bahamas. You go over the Bahamas, you see all those clear, those clear water and those nice tropical fish, but there are no rivers, there are no major estuaries where fresh water and, and marine waters intermix, and you're missing all those, those, those habitats, those ecotones. However, you do have post-glacial mixing of uh, faunas from the north, the Gulf, and the Caribbean, which increases the richness. And, and, and one point that we should make is Florida is situated on the north-south axis and uh, therefore dips into these regions. And the Gulf Stream comes along the east coast of Florida, not the west coast. I grew up in Sarasota. I didn't know what a sailfish or a mahi-mahi was, or a Portuguese man-of-war. None of that came in here. When everybody rafted from Cuba, those rafts hit this shoreline, not this shoreline. There are a hundred and some fewer fish species over here than over here, largely because of the Gulf Stream. And this is also the major source of animals coming up from the Caribbean. Now I've placed that circle, that's a 10-mile circle, it should be a 10-mile radius circle around St. Lucie Inlet. And that circle, you can see, is an, a temperature ecotone is in there, hot, cool water. This is February day. And there's also a salinity ecotone in there. There's the temperature, the cool water and the warm water coming together. And there's also a salinity ecotone there because you have a river there, which even though it's quite small, the St. Lucie River is the largest river between the river of grass that empties here at Whitewater Bay and the St. John's River up here. That is over 500 miles there, and that's the river. <laughs> so that you have an ecotone there, and if any fish from the tropics comes up here hunting for fresh water, he's, that's the place he's going to settle. Now, at one time, we didn't have these inlets uh, as stabilized inlets. This, this lagoon turned fresh in many places. And uh, actually, in World War II, some of these inlets were allowed to close, and it did turn fresh in the 1940s around Jupiter Inlet and uh, around Sebastian Inlet. This is the amount of tide or water that comes through those inlets graphically presented. This is a Ned Smith diagram, and I guess I have it backwards there. but. The um, Fort Pierce Inlet is exchanging the majority of the water. St. Lucie next, and Sebastian, very little compared to these two. These are extremely important on the biodiversity side because they allow the ocean access to the lagoon. And it turns out that these inlets are some of our richest areas. The fish that actually spawn on the continental shelf, the groupers and the snappers, for instance, their young come in, and they'll be coming in in another couple months and settling in seagrasses adjacent to ocean inlets. And this will be a number of the grouper species we see on the market and all the snapper species, mutton, lane, yellowtail snapper. They utilize the inlet regions. And that inlet is the richest, uh, fish fauna there is the richest in the lagoon. As you go upstream, you see fewer species and more individuals in some species, such as anchovies, for instance. So when I pick a place in the lagoon that has the highest biodiversity of any location in the Indian River Lagoon, it's going to be the St. Lucie Inlet area. And in fact, that circle, 10-mile circle, that I, I'll put the center of it here at Sailfish Point, contains 800 species of fish that have been recorded from it. Actually, over 800 fish species. Now, 
and uh, because of some of the exotics that have come in. Plus, we had a new species of fish that actually described two years ago from the Stuart Causeway. Um, the reason this is so rich is given here. These are all the different habitats. We know it's an ecotone temperature. It's a salinity ecotone. Here's the St. Lucie River. Fresh water is coming out here. Hopefully not too much fresh water out of uh, Lake Okeechobee, et cetera. And then we have corals growing on this reef right here, which is the furthest north some of the stony corals grow. That's the state park. And we have seagrasses here. In fact, the largest species collection I ever made with a small net, a single collection, I collected 56 species. Same number of trees in my front yard in one haul in May. Uh, unfortunately, that spot does not exist anymore. It was right in here. Uh, and it was made a number of years ago. But those seagrasses are still very rich areas, very speciose when they're there. In fact, that's the richest habitat. You see 260 species of fish recorded from seagrass. There's many species of fish there are in Chesapeake Bay. Now, I wanted to talk about some individual fish that you might be familiar with in a little bit more detail. Um, most people are, are familiar with the snook. Uh, the snook uh, is one of our most sought after game sport recreational fishes here in Florida. And we've studied it for a number of years. This, by the way, is not the common snook looking at you here. This is the sword spine snook, which is the smallest snook, which also occurs here, but has received little study. I'm going to talk about the ecophysiology of snook uh, and how that lends itself to diversity within the snook itself uh, the, and how we might see subpopulations of snook forming. And then it's, of course, a top predator and is a primary predator in this lagoon system. It can go into freshwater freely. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about the evolution and the sibling species that we have here, including this guy right here, which we really know very little about. Now, most people, uh, when you say snook, think of this. And, uh, and actually, they, they reach an even larger size than this guy right here. Uh, by the way, I failed to mention in the earlier talk, these fish are what we call protandric hermaphrodites. They're male first, and then they change to females later. So this is a female, her size. If uh, we had one about this, far in length, it would certainly be a male. Why they change sex, when they change sex, and how they change sex, uh, under what circumstances, we don't know. We know for groupers, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but we don't know for, for snook. And we consider it a tropical species. However, we had a cold uh, period in 1977 when I was working here at Harbor Branch, where it snowed here in Vero, it snowed in the Bahamas, it snowed in Miami. and um, and the ship channel out here cooled down top to bottom eight to six degrees through the entire column. And I, I was collecting fish. I actually published on this particular cold period. And I noticed a school of snook that uh, group actually, a number of them died at 14 degrees centigrade. However, there's still a school of snook at the seawall uh, where I was making my observations, even at temperatures at six degrees centigrade. So a group died at 14, then another group did not die at all, went through the whole thing. So that told me there was a, a different ecophysiology in some of these guys, that some of them were likely uh, adapted to the cooler waters. Now, if you take a look at our area, you know, the temperatures in, in the cold winter, you see it's cooler further south. It's very possible that... Uh, there was an evolution of a uh, cool water species down here, possibly in the northern Indian River Lagoon as well, subpopulation that can take the, the cooler temperatures. Um, we wouldn't call it a subspecies because it obviously um, breeds with all the others, and hence we get a high genetic heterogeneity. So we have more genetic heterogeneity over here on this coast than we do over here. And this is likely because we're constantly getting these warm water snook, probably those little guys, uh, with the Gulf Stream 
flying from Cuba and Belize or wherever. Um, so they had that population that died at 14C, which you see is about 56, 57 degrees, and then population that can survive at least 46 degrees Fahrenheit, 8C, a tropical species, quote. And this is the main area uh, where we see it still go through its entire life history on the East Coast here. Uh, and they depend on mangroves and fresh water as well in their life history. Now, we have five species of snook here. There are six species in all of the Caribbean. We have five of those six here reproducing. Uh, this is the sword spine. This is the next most common one is the fat snook and then the tarpon snook. The tarpon snook actually, I think, is more abundant than we realize, but it just isn't being collected. In fact, when they blew up the Stuart Bregs, and I went down to examine the fish that came up when they blew up the old Bregs, uh, the tarpon snook was the number one snook in, in abundance that was killed in that Bregs explosion. And we really don't know where it's spawning, what it's doing. We don't really know much about any of these others, but they're all occurring here in freshwater and in the uh, lower reaches of the freshwater tributary. In case of tarpon snook out in the estuary itself. Now, one thing uh, that I noticed, you notice, well, you can notice they all have different size eyes and things of that nature, but this is the smallest one. The smallest one has the largest anal spine. We call it the sword spine, <laughs> rightfully so. The tarpon snook has a fairly large spine. It's a fairly small one on the fat snook. We think that this is for uh, escaping predation. And, we, and that's been the thought behind fish spines in general. So he's carrying around quite a saber. Well, who, who would be the primary predator? Well, it would probably be the common snook. <laughs> we could reach the size to eat this. And we know the common snook eats its own progeny. Uh, and so we, we had done experiments actually with spine size and snook and predation. I'll relate that in a second. But you can see, even in the common snook, when you, when you go for it, this is my hand here. So that's a fairly small snook. <laughs> uh, the size of the spine relative to the body length is reduced the larger the fish gets. And of course, predation on this fish is far less than on this one. These seek very shallow water. You can almost predict now where they're going to settle in fresh water and in the uh, wetlands out here. Very shallow water. It has to be an area where we're going to have some flow. We're going to have plenty of prey available for them to grow fast quickly because they, they want to get to this side. In fact, this snook will mature in four or five months uh, if it has sufficient food. Now, with our five species of snook, we have all the spe species of tropical maharas that occur in North America here. This is the only place in the country that's this way. We think they co-evolved because our juvenile snook actually swim with these guys as juveniles and then eat them as adults. And this is true with a number of fish. We just found king mackerel schooling with anchovies along the beach. And that's probably, you know, of course, they'll eat the anchovies when they're large. Um, note the spine size on this one here. I actually found a snook in, the, in, de in its death rows with this species in its mouth, with that spine through the roof of its mouth, sticking into its brain. So it does work. And, and this one's mostly associated with fresh water. And look at its spine. And it's a striped mahara. All these maharas have jaws that slip out. They feed on benthic invertebrates for the most part. These are not predators on other fish, but on invertebrates in the bottom. <coughs> and they're prime prey for snook. We found that actually in one experiment where we had this one and this one in the aquarium, uh, without a snook, they were out over sand bottom, didn't go into seagrass, put the snook in the aquarium. He ran into seagrass. He never did. He says, dare you, I have a spine. So, uh, okay, now going out to the reefs. The reefs, of course, have some of our most diverse faunas. And I, I had a bluefin tuna story in here because um, when I saw this painting, it brought back uh, a lot of memories. Um, but the first dive that the Harbor Branch submarine made with the scientists on board was our uh, physiologist, Bob Meek, was directly across the Gulf Stream from us here off of Grand Bahama. 
He was surrounded by a school of bluefin tunas, and this painting is of the bluefin tunas as they migrate past Bimini. Bimini was a, a great place to fish for bluefin tunas, and bluefin tuna tournaments used to occur there. And if you read any of Hemingway's books, Islands in the Stream, he, he gives that account. Um, and of course, this fish is almost gone now. Uh, and uh, it's quite expensive. It's sold in a skiki market in Japan. I think one bluefin rarely makes that, that uh, market, but they can go for a million dollars. This is a submarine that used to be here, and we could sit in the sphere here, uh, and we had good visibility. And I was quite interested in how this submarine could be used to determine the fish populations on our reefs. How many species were they? Um, what were they doing out there? What's the ecology of the reef? And so we started working on it to try to determine how it might be able to capture fish. Uh, there were thrusters facing all directions, so the submarine could actually go up and down and around like a helicopter. Uh, and we've developed suction systems uh, called the critter getter. We had a chemical. We could put a sedative out to put the fish to sleep. We uh, Also, I don't show it here, but we had a laser-guided spear gun with nine shots in the, with the laser gun. And the head of the spear was hollow, so we could put a sedative in there, put the fish to sleep, or a tag, and tag the fish. We've tagged sharks down to 3,000 feet. This could go to 3,000 feet. And we have about 350 dives. And every time I left the dock here on a major expedition, I came back with new species of fish. Uh, the, the mother load was the Galapagos Islands, where we had 30 new species in 18 days. And these are animals never seen by humans before. And all told, if you add up those missions, we had well over 100 species. Uh, some we're going to be naming in the next couple of weeks with some of my colleagues. And uh, I mentioned earlier, Dennis was with that mission that he was with me. Uh, he brought up some algae off of uh, Belize. He was Belize. Could have been Chinchoro. Anyway, in that algae was this brilliant red blenny, uh, and it was a new species. I mean, you just turn around and they're a new species. And uh, so has the ocean been explored? <laughs> no. And that never ended. It never went out and was never came back with new species of fish. That's fish. You know, you got nose invertebrates and everything else. Uh, we also had a basket we could put things in. And, uh, and those were marvelous expeditions. This is a hydrophone. I'm into fish sounds, too. I listen to them talk. And they do talk, by the way. And we were going down on the groupers on the Oculina Bank and proving that they had spawned there. Uh, and we'd sit down on the bottom, turn the lights off, all the hydraulics sit there eight hours a day and watch the groupers do their thing. If you didn't shut down, you, you frightened them away. And uh, we didn't want to do that. Well, then we found out that they were spawning and, uh, on the Oculina Reef there. And there were several species. Uh, this is a scamp. This is a speckled hind, which we don't see anymore, by the way. Uh, and we don't know why, but it's been heavily fished. The scamp seems to be able to reproduce a little bit better than, than the speckled hind. This is Jeff's Reef, the one that was discovered off here. The uh, discovery is quite interesting in that the founder of Harbor Branch, uh, Seward Johnson Sr., uh, who is one of the Johnson Johnson brothers, uh, um, and Ed Link, Seward Sr. was actually riding the submarine. I think he was in his late 70s, early 80s at the time. And our subpilot, Jeff Prentice, uh, was a scientist subpilot. They were riding together. We call it Jeff's Reef to this day. It's known as Jeff's Reef. Ran into the Oculina Coral Reef, and no one knew the Oculina Coral was forming reefs off here. So they made the discovery. And almost every scientist at Harbor Branch went out there to study this area for several years. I was looking at the grouper populations. This is the uh, gag grouper, which if you uh, go into Publix and order a grouper, you're likely to be eating this fish at $25 a pound. <laughs> uh, and they had different colors that you saw on the bottom that you never saw on the surface, had different behaviors. And uh, they actually, uh, the scamp was the one we really figured out because it was down here in the bottom all around the submarine. There were 12, 14 females in these groups and one male. And the male would dive on the females and produce a certain color pattern. Well, we know that uh, there 
hermaphroditic, that they are first female and they change the male. And so we, we wanted to see if we took that male out, uh, if these females would uh, change their behavior, but unfortunately we were unsuccessful in doing that. Eventually what happened was uh, a number of my colleagues in South Carolina and elsewhere uh, were able to determine exactly where and when they change sex. And it turns out it's in shallow water. They aren't changing sex out here. They meet in shallow water, and unfortunately this has made them accessible to the inshore spear fishery in Florida. Florida is the only, East Coast is the only place where you can spear these spear the groupers. And single fishermen will take 5,000 pounds of this grouper in one year. We had uh, summer before last a, a gentleman who took 1,000 pounds in one morning out of Fort Pierce by spearing them. Well, he actually power hit them. He, he shot them with the bullets. And um, anyway, that kind of destroys the sex reversal thing. But when they, uh, when they come in, we have films of this now where they come in and they go nose to nose. They go through these color patterns and everything. And they also produce sound. And so Fred didn't show up. Uh, Mary, you're going to be Fred this year? And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. And it takes her about two, three months to change sex. And then they go out to the Oculina Reef, where you see there in spawn. Uh, takes a while. So the sex ratio makes a big difference in the health of the fishery. If all the males have gone, you got problems. And the number of males per female, and that's been happening with groupers all over. In fact, we have some grouper populations that just we don't see them at all anymore. And of course, the NASA grouper is in trouble uh, throughout the Caribbean. Uh, this one, the speckled hyena, we think is virtually extinct, locally extinct or extirpated on the Oculina Reef. The scamper there, we still see them, but in reduced numbers. And the snowy, we haven't seen out there in years, probably 25 years. This was in place in the genus Hyperthotus, which is a new uh, genus, but I think very appropriate for the deep water groupers. There are four in that, uh, actually the uh, Warsaw's in that too, where everybody else is in a different uh, genus, these big ones, and this is the Warsaw that we'd see out there commonly, are in Hyperthotus, and they can go all the way down to two or 3,000 feet. Uh, we also found that uh, they live a quite a long time, uh, we call this one scar side because he had a scar on his side, which we think was from a shark bite. And we see him quite frequently out there. In fact, uh, John Reed, who you've probably heard, who studies the corals out there, had scar side follow him when he'd lock out of the submarine, tend to his corals. Scar side would follow him around like a dog and actually watch him as he was tying his corals down. And um, he'd come up to the submarine and look. This, this fish, by the way, is six, seven feet long and between three, four hundred, maybe even five hundred pounds. So it's a large fish. It's not, it's not a small fish. The Goliath grouper inshore is similar in size to this one offshore. However, we now know from aging other individuals, not scar side, because I was called in to a fish house here. And they, they knew this animal because we've been, we've been with him for years. Um, it was caught. And I, I rebuilt his skull, and I had it hanging in my office when I worked here. I still have that skull. Um, and uh, there was one large Warsaw on each reef about four miles apart. And I actually saw these chase the smaller groupers, scamp, because they might even eat them. Um, and they were, that was their reef, and they wanted to see what we were doing. Now, unfortunately... Uh, they can still be speared. Uh, well, not legally, not anymore. <laughs> well, in the Gulf they can be, but not over here. This is the Gulf of Mexico spearing. Um, we've aged this, uh, these fish now. We know that they live up to 100 years. And uh, that's why it's illegal to even catch one over here, by the way, off the East Coast now. So this young man has got a fish that's probably older than his grandfather. And, and when they first aged, uh, the yellow age, which is the same genus as this guy, and found that the, that genus is a long-lived group of groupers. Uh, it was in the 1980s, early 80s, and uh, the biologist turned to the biologist and said, you know, this grouper egg hatched before the Wright brothers flew their plane. And, uh, you know, because they went through World War I, World War II, the Depression, everything else. 
then ended up like this. <laughs> and everybody's proud of their large fish, but we should leave those large fish in the ocean. Now the problem with the Warsaw compared to the Goliath grouper is they'll go all the way down to 1,000 feet, 600 feet. So you, you fish that deep, you bring one up, he's not going to survive going back down. He's dead. So you got to make the choice. Are you going to drop your line back down again? If you get another Warsaw, what have you done? You know, And it's a big dilemma for the fish, fishery and fishery management. And of course, they've disappeared at, uh, at Jeff's Reef. Now, our inshore reefs actually have the greatest biodiversity of local richness. Uh, there are many species here. This one is only found between Jupiter and Sebastian Inlet in uh, the United States. It occurs down in Central America. And this one has a similar distribution. There's one out there that has a larger spot on its tail that people often mistake it for this one. But this is the most abundant. Uh, this is uh, a spot tail porgy on the reefs here. And we have a number of fish that fall into that category, but there's several hundred species of fish that depend on these shallow nearshore fish uh, reef formations. Some for as nursery grounds, like some of the snappers, and some as their adult feeding grounds. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen this book. It's receiving some publicity now, but it just came out this year. And uh, it is describing the sixth extinction, which... Um, it's caused by us, <laughs> not that asteroid that hit and got rid of the dinosaurs or the great extinctions before that. And uh, it's possible that it might be the greatest extinction on Earth, and that's going to be a great reduction in biodiversity. And what's causing it? Uh, there are lots of things. You know, there's habitat loss. Um, you know, everybody can look at the deforestation of the Amazon and other places as well, Florida. Um, and, of course, some people think, well, uh, what is becoming extinct? Or what became extinct? Well, if we finish this lecture 12,000 years ago, walking out to the parking lot here, you'd have to worry about this guy. Because we had three species of saber-toothed tigers here locally. And, and there were numbers of them, apparently a number of prey, to finding their skulls, you know. There's no cat around today that has a skull like that. This is a Bray tar pit, Los Angeles uh, skull. We also had running around here uh, elephants, mastodon in this case. In fact, a mastodon was dug up on the south property here at Harbor Branch a number of years ago. There are mastodons that have been dug up elsewhere in Vero Beach. And in fact, a number of years ago, I got a call from Harbor Branch here. I was no longer here, but they told me somebody called in and said there were um, some mastodon bones being dug up down off Old Dixie Highway down here. We went to this gentleman's house, and he had spread out on the couch. Well, they didn't know what it was. They said it's a, a, some extinct animal. And we went in there and said, what is this? I said, well, it's an elephant. You know, This six-year-old son was bringing these bones out of the canal uh, down there, not too far from Old Dixie. And, uh, and he had an elephant on his couch. So we had these guys around here in herds, and apparently the slaver tooth tigers were hunting them as well. What happened to them all? Well, there's one theory that this is what happened to them all. They all went to the barbecue. Uh, now, some of you might be familiar with this committee in Vero Beach. They have a tent behind the county uh, commission chambers over there right now digging up bones of all these Ice Age animals, and this committee formed to help get support for that activity. And one of the big finds, uh, which has made some international recognition, this is a tusk of a mastodon or mammoth, we don't know which, and that's a carving of uh, a mastodon or a mammoth on it. And that turned out was authenticated. In fact, they compared it to one fossil like it in the museum in London, the Natural History Museum there, found out that that one was a fake, that this was most likely an original and possibly 12, 13,000 years old. <clears throat> so and it's one of the oldest carvings. We not, well, that means is there were people here, okay? <laughs> there were a lot of people here before uh, so-called natives moved in, okay? 
And, um, and these plains here actually had buffalo herds. We know from the early Spanish records that there were buffalo herds out here. And of course, we know that we had a red wolf out here. We had coyotes. We had the coyotes back now. There were all kinds of things out here. There were giant ground sloths. Uh, what happened to these guys? Well, <laughs> these are mostly extinct, those mastodons, et cetera, the giant ground sloths, and we could just go down the list, the giant tortoise, all those things that wandered around Vero Beach here. Um, we know we don't have wolves anymore. We don't have the red wolf. Uh, we have a few panthers left down at the end. The panther in my driveway, we think, was a Texas transplant. It wasn't a Florida panther. Uh, we know some birds have disappeared. The Carolina parakeet, as an example, we've had a bird disappear since I've been here called the Dusky Seaside Sparrow. And it's actually a book on that saga called A Shadow and a Song. And uh, we had a, a fish, our bird biologist, Herb Kale, here locally that studied it. Um, and then, of course, we get down to this, this size, the insects, crustaceans, and mollusks. And we had a number of good people here that studied the mollusks and the crustaceans and then the ant lab down the road here. However, we really don't know what the situation is here with all these guys. The smaller we go, we really don't, I mean, we, we really don't know with uh, some of these, I mean, the fishes. We have these Christmas bird counts and a lot of people birding, but what about the fishes? Anything under the surface of the water we're having problems with. Uh, what about the fungi, the bacteria, the diatoms, the things that really make these systems go? We have no idea what's going on there. Have there been extinctions? Well, <clears throat> we know now, in the last couple of years, the seagrass has had problems. It's disappeared in some areas of the lagoon. This is one area that has disappeared a couple times. And it's receiving water and toxic water, and microcystis, a toxic uh, bacteria. Um, you could even come in contact last summer with this water. That was our most diverse habitat. So what about all the microorganisms, crustaceans, and mollusks associated with it? Not just the fish. I'm, this is a fish species, that's all. What about the freshwater animals? They were in the middle of all this. And that was released from Lake Okeechobee. What about this reef formation here? There are species that we haven't seen in years there that associate with the, the benthos there. What about the mangroves? And of course, the mangroves are really taking a hit with the impoundments that Dennis was talking about. We figured out how we could put pipes to reconnect them, but they're still not fully uh, back to what we think uh, they should be. So who will survive in the end? Uh, this is a big question. And the survivors, when we go down the submarine, I didn't say this in an earlier lecture, but when we go down the submarine, we see living fossils, things that were around so all these other great extinctions took place. They lived through it all. So in the deep, dark ocean, there are survivors. But how about up here? We do have some survivors. You know, alligators have been around for a while. There are a number of plants that have been around for a while. Cypress have been around for a while. And these ecotones that we were talking about earlier, the land-water interface is a very rigorous environment. A lot of the organisms that adapted to that environment some of the first organisms we think on Earth are still living in certain places of the Earth in this ecotone. And they've gone through all those great extinctions. They're super animals. And I'm going to introduce you to one which I think is a super fish. He lives locally uh, among and a lot of other places. They're wetland. We're going to start talking about wetland species. And this is where we have to be careful with what we call quality water because these wetlands often go without oxygen, naturally. And we did physiological work with these fish. That tarpon depicted there has a lung. It can breathe air. It doesn't need the air in the water. The snook, as a young snook, less than six inches, doesn't need air in the water either. It comes to the surface. Breathe. Same thing with this little mosquito fish over here, which the snook, by the way, loves to eat that guy. In fact, um, this fish is a live bear. It bears 12, 14 young or more. Uh, every two weeks they mature from birth. And if you calculate that out, you could have the biomass of the planet Earth in one year. So it's good that the snook eats this guy. In fact, we found when we started looking at snook feeding habits back in the 1970s and early 80s, we found that snook, 15 millimeters long, an inch is 25, okay? 
15 millimeter snook will eat the newborn of the mosquito fish. Apparently it's sitting down here waiting for her to give birth. And uh, hence, that's why she, go, she produces as much as she does. This is also known as a guppy. You see them in aquarium stores and things like that. Okay, so high reproductive rate to keep up with that. All these fish are marvelous in that they can withstand unbelievable conditions in these wetlands. I've said several times you don't have to improve the water quality in these wetlands because they'll let mom and dad come in and eat all these guys, and you don't want that to happen. Uh, this fish has the world record. This is the sheep's head minnow. I call it the super fish. Ecophysiologically, it occurs in deserts and wetlands. Right now, this fish is under the ice in the Jersey wetland, estivating and waiting for the ice to melt. But it's also here in Indian River County right now. And we've actually collected this fish, and the colleagues of mine have collected this fish at water temperatures up to 108 degrees. It's the highest water temperature of any fish uh, on the planet. We know the ice fish can take ice, uh, not just this guy. The desert pupfish is in the same genus, and we think the desert pupfish uh, originated with this particular, uh, this is the ancestral species, Suprinidon variegatus. If you go through the Caribbean and all the little islands, all the islands have a Suprinidon on them. In fact, we went to uh, San Salvador, the most, one of the most remote islands in the Bahamas, and there was a printed on four species in the little lake there that had never been seen before. One made a living eating scales off its siblings, <laughs> and uh, yeah, nothing else to eat. And then uh, another one, it was like the alien, you know how the alien will open up and then this jaw flips out? That's it's like it has teeth, and then this jaw flips out. I wonder what he's eating. Well, it had snail heads in his gut. Nothing but snail heads. So he's going up these snails and whipping their heads off. That's what he was doing. So he ended up with uh, four species in this little lake in San Salvador. Uh, the only fish that could actually survive in those lakes because of the conditions. And they um, radiated uh, into several different species. By the way, this guy eats on the bacteria mats over here in the wetlands. It feeds on these open bottoms. And um, it forms, and this is our studies in several different impoundments here, the greatest biomass of any of the fishes in the wetland. The next is the mullet. This, uh, the mullet's here, uh, which goes in and out of these things. This one lives in there. And as it turns out, where you had a high mangrove cover, this is a mangrove forest. There were very few fish. Where you had open meadows, salt turns, there are large numbers of this fish. And it turns out that somebody else was looking at bird feeding habits. When we did these studies, Herb Kale, he kept on bringing me this fish. The wading birds were gorging on sheep's head minnows. So the wading birds needed this fish. They also needed the open area in which to feed on them. And it was this bacterial mat, which anybody look at it, so there was nothing out there. There's nothing out there. Well, that's reproducing like this, and these fish are these, these chunky little fish. They're just eating it, and then they're being eaten by the wading birds. I don't know if you're familiar with Round Island Park. The Round Island boat ramp is right up in here in Indian River County. It's across the lagoon from us. That was our study site. You know, the study site before me it started in the 1950s. Uh, and a lot of work done with fish, mosquitoes, plants, everything in there. What we found was that that fish, the pup fish, preferred the open areas and did not like the mangrove canopy. And of course, we had a mangrove canopy study site further south. Same thing with the wading birds. They preferred the open ground. And what's been happening, and this is a recent photograph, red mangroves have been encroaching on this and decreasing the diversity of the habitat. In fact, my first study area across here, which I started back in 1978, they, this is the way the wetlands looked here, almost everywhere you went. They were white deserts. It looked like somebody had burned them over. And what they had done is flooded them to control the mosquitoes and killed all the black mangroves. And there weren't many reds back in here. But the reds came in later. And this is 
the succulent plants and grasses come in, they're red parvigules in there too, those little reds coming up. Three years later, you couldn't walk in here because of the reds. No one planted them. This is 300 acres. There was a breach in the dike at one spot, and I think I'm going to show that here. You can see the breach that came in later. This is the culvert I studied. This is, today, this is a red mangrove forest. You can't walk through there. Nobody planted any of those trees. And now we know the reds are going further north. My concern is, as we stabilize the upland edge, this is A1A, uh, and we have houses or whatever up here, as sea level rises, the reds will come in further and further, and we'll lose all these sheep's head minnow and waiting bird feeding sites. We're losing biodiversity. So I encourage somehow being able to keep the diversity of plant communities in here that we saw initially, we won't be able to keep it all, but at least up here, and, and this is a great place because simply because you have a hammock here, you don't have any hotels or houses or anything of that nature. This is Avalon, Avalon State Park. Now, if you're familiar with that. And of course, one of the big problems is us. We've, uh, we haven't stabilized yet, actually, and uh, we're still growing everywhere. And uh, this is what we look like. Um, and we're all connected to the lagoon here. We have canals and everything that connect us. That's the St. Lucie River North Fork. And if we look ourselves globally, and I think the, the uh, lights at night are just fantastic. I mean, this is, this is China and Japan, Korea. Korea's really taken off there. Huh? Hong Kong, you can see Hong Kong, all right. Uh, and then here's India, of course. Um, and you can see, really, how much of an impact we can have, particularly those of us who of industrializing can have plenty of light bulbs. I, I had a story before, I wasn't sure I was going to tell it again, but um, Dennis brought up during dinner, I'll tell it again. I had a meeting out here in Hawaii, and we left, the plane left after 12 o'clock, and um, there was a meteor shower. I knew there was a meteor shower occurring, then I usually try to catch these things, one of the big ones of the year. And um, it's the one that occurs in November, whichever one that is. Uh, anyway, I decided to look out the window of the plane, and sure enough, you see the meteorites, the little things popping underneath, the different colors popping under the plane. Like, Whoa! And so I put the blanket over my head, and I just stayed on the, on the, on the window. Everybody else was reading books or going to sleep. Uh, the stewardess came by and said, I know what you're doing, because the pilot and co-pilot are just going wild up in the cockpit, because these things are flashing by, you know. And uh, this was right after 9-11, uh, just a month or two, so we had a, another airliner flying about a mile away, and you can see them going under that airliner as well, so I just stayed there the whole time on the window. Now, there are no ground lights from Hawaii to San Francisco or LA. LA. So the next night, I said, wow, this is going to be spectacular. It's a clear night. I couldn't see anything because of all the light coming off the ground. All the light there, you couldn't see these little specks were popping up. So, next time you're in Hawaii, <laughs> I guess you could fly that way too, you know. <laughs> Do it after midnight during a meter shower. You won't believe it. And, uh, but all that light there just took it away. And you couldn't see anything in Europe either, I'm sure. You know, England, France, Spain, Germany. Italy, everything's lit up. So we do have, we do have a global effect, uh, and most people think we don't. Um, this is actually a temperature profile of our atmosphere. Um, here are the highest mountains and everything. See that temperature goes down rapidly to about minus 50 degrees. That'd be pretty cold. You're freezing up here. And that's in kilometers. It's called a tropopause. And these skyscrapers don't go up in the tropopause, but uh, all the smog from those towns, and I'm talking about China, India, Japan, everywhere, okay? Let's go back to that, uh, this slide here. You see that? Our atmosphere is just a thin little strip right there. You go out and jog a couple miles, and you jog past our atmosphere. What I was going to show you here with this cloud 
you look up at these clouds in Florida, this way you get these big thunderheads in the summer, they might top out at 35,000 feet or might go up to 40,000, 50,000 feet. You don't have to go that far. And you're going to need an oxygen mask. There's no air to breathe. This is all the air we need right down here. You drive from here to the traffic light on Old Dixie, you're over all the air we can breathe. That's not much. And tell me that building a coal-fired plant every two to three weeks or every month in China is not affecting that. And of course, you know, we have natural things that affect it as well. And we know, we've documented what these, what Mount St. Helens did or other volcanoes have done with our atmosphere. And a lot of this has gone worldwide. And we can't really blame it on these guys. Uh, it's us. And then, I think this is my last slide. Um, what our future will lie, be like here uh, is being predicted. Um, there's one road there in Miami Beach, I guess, that goes underwater every year now. Um, I just heard that the glaciers in Greenland, uh, this one large glacier they keep track of, is receding at 150 feet a day. And if it melts on a landmass like Greenland or Antarctic landmass, that's water that, get, when it reaches the sea, is raising sea level. And the sea level rate, when I first started working here at Harbor Branch, was 2.5 centimeters every 10 years. It's about an inch every 10 years. Now it's well over 3 centimeters per 10 years. So the rate has increased. You say, well, you know, this winter, everything's going to be frozen. Well. Let's look at this next week when everything's flooding, <laughs> okay? And when it's 75 degrees in Chicago or whatever. Uh, the weather's crazy. Anyway, uh, I'm going to invest in uh, some signs to put out in front of my property. I'm 25 feet above sea level, so I figure I might have till the turn of the century anyway. And I can sell it. I don't know if I'll be around, but maybe my grandchildren or something. But, uh, what's going to happen to biodiversity? Well, I told everybody earlier, the fish are going to have a ball, right? They really are. They're going to be checking in at the front desk right down here. <laughs> and it'll be groupers. And they'll be able to change sex and do all that stuff they want to do, all right? And uh, the jacks will be up on the second or third story. And uh, they'll inherit Florida, okay? And those will be spectacular dive sites. Somebody's going to make a bundle taking people down to see the, the groupers checking people in. But uh, <laughs> that's what will happen, and it looks like it is happening. Meanwhile, life on Earth will continue somehow. It's for our benefit, us, that we want to conserve biodiversity right now. It's not for, and we think, well, we'll just try to save the fish, okay. And unfortunately, I'm not seeing much uh, there, but um, it's for our benefit. And uh, what happens is these organisms are going to inherit the earth one way or another, and there'll be enough more biodiversity in the future. But for ourselves, we have to try to change our ways somehow. Thank you. Thank you.